Okay, welcome back to our Bible study, and we're going to continue our study in biblical interpretation from Roy Zuck's book, Basic Bible Interpretation. And you were asked for this week to read chapter 6. Did anyone get a chance to at least open up chapter 6 and look at it at all? Okay, well thank you to those of you. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, well, you can go back and read chapter 6 and you can go into further depth on the things that we're going to talk about tonight. We've talked about how the Bible is a book that is living and active. And so it really, not it's just a book that we read, but it also reads us. And it tells us things that we didn't even know about ourselves. And it tells us about a God who is alive today, about Jesus Christ, our living and resurrected Savior. So the Bible is alive. And yet it is a book that was written many centuries ago, and so there are a lot of gaps between the time that it was written and the world in which it was written and the present day that we live today. So God doesn't change, and human nature doesn't change. As Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. There's not really anything fundamentally that has changed, and yet we just live in a different world. So as we open this book, we discover a lot of similarities, but also a lot of differences from the world that we live in. And that takes some effort for us to bridge those different gaps. Can you think of any of the gaps that we've talked about so far that we have to put in some effort and bridge in order for us to kind of get back into the shoes of the original authors and the original readers of the Bible? Grammatical. Good. There's a gap called the grammatical gap. So we're bridging the gap from our present day grammar, which is what we grew to know even just from being on the lap of our mother. We were listening. We were watching, we were learning, we picked up language, and we understand how grammar works a little bit because we all speak and we communicate. Uh, as we go to school, we learn some of the mechanics of what's going on with grammar, but there is a gap that has to be bridged between how we speak and understand and write and read and speak and how they did back in ancient times. So the grammatical gap, and particularly the fact that uh, the Bible was written in Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic. We need some help in order to make sure that we're properly understanding it. It's been translated for us, and we're thankful for that, but we need to bridge those gaps. Can you think of any other gaps that we need to bridge? Good idea. So uh, Abby said sin, and there's a big, big gap between us and God because of our sin. So that's a good answer. And uh, that's not one of the gaps we've talked about in Bible study, but that is one of the gaps the Bible talks about in order for us to be right with God and to spend eternity with him in heaven. We need somebody to bridge that gap for us. And that's what Jesus did. He created a way, like a bridge, to allow us to go to a place we wouldn't have been able to go if it wasn't for Jesus' sacrifice. Cultural. Okay, good. The cultural gap. The cultural and along with that, the historical gap. Just the fact that we live in a different part of the world we live in a different era they did, than they did back in Bible times. So as you're learning about farming or you're learning about shepherding or you're learning about what a home was like or how the government was set up or how military worked and all the manners, all the customs, uh, so many different aspects of our Bible are immersed in the culture. And we have to use some of the tools that are available and kind of recreate the scene of what it was like to be back in Bible times in order for us to properly understand the Bible. Any comments or questions on that so far? Okay, tonight we're going to be talking about another gap, which is called the literary gap. And this is one that many Christians never really hear about or learn about. But the Bible is certainly a book. We understand that. And every book has a certain style that it is written in. The Bible is written in a number of different styles. And those styles, there's a fancy word that gets used. It's the word genre. You might want to write that down. G E N R E. And our book on interpretation says that this comes from the Latin genus, which is the idea of a different family or, or there's different parts. And so we even have, like in our classification of animals and plants, there's the genus and there's the species. Well, genre is speaking of literary styles, okay? There's literary styles or categories. Anybody here subscribe to the newspaper still? I do. It's good to get the local newspaper and know what's going on and to sort of, sort of stay involved and informed. And what are some of the different literary styles that you'll find in a newspaper? Um, 
ok so there's usually a section somewhere toward the back maybe toward the end of section a which would be like commentary and possibly like an editorial so maybe the editorial board of the newspaper wrote it or maybe it was like the mail bag of people wrote in letters to the editor ok so you have comments and opinion that's being written can you think of one Abby Very good. So sports, there's usually the sports page and always really neat action pictures are taken. So even like images is a genre that's a form of communication. You're seeing pictures and you're seeing um, sports journalism and then also people who died. What do we call that? Do you remember? Oh, obituary. The obituary is the page where loved ones have recently died and you can read a little story about them and when they were born, when they died, who their family was, what kind of jobs they had. Very good. Okay, that's a style of literature in the newspaper. We also have, um, you know, there's actual news reports. There's also uh, my favorite section, which is the comics. You gotta have comics in the newspaper, maybe the crosswords, uh, classifieds. So you have all these different areas. It's one document, it's one rolled up newspaper, but you know it has a variety of different literary forms. Just think about how somebody mentioned commentary earlier. You could have on section A, the first page, a report of some kind of newsworthy event that's happened. You could also have uh, an editor or someone writing in on their personal opinions of that event. And you could also have a cartoon, like a um, uh, political cartoon, which is some, like a satire of what that event or what that person is. So you have different genres that are sort of portraying the, sep the same event from different angles. And you need to know what kind of material you're looking at in order to read it and understand it properly. Well, the Bible's a big book, and the Bible has a lot of different styles that it was written in as well. Can you think of any styles that the Bible has in it? And these were talked about in the chapter, but there's several different genres or literary styles. Poetry. Good, a big one is going to be poetry. What would be an example of poetry in the Bible? Psalms, right? That's the Hebrew songbook. So we have 150 different psalms or songs that were written. Those are poems actually that were set to music. We don't have the music anymore. We don't have any recordings of the music. Man, that would be so cool if we actually had an old record that was found or some kind of a recording of what it sounded like for the Hebrews. We don't have any of their music written down. Uh, we don't have any of it recorded. So one day when we get to heaven, we can ask, David, how did you originally compose Psalm 51 to be sung? And maybe he'll sing it for us and what that original song was. We have all the words, the inspired words, but we don't have any of the music. And so now it's being put to new music today. Um, I heard somebody else say, Job, yes. Mm -hmm. Job, believe it or not, would be a, a book of poetry. So it's not written, although the early chapters are a little bit more narrative where there's a story and it talks about how God is in heaven and they're having this divine counsel and actually Satan is there and approaches him and God speaks with him. So you have discourse or dialogue going on and you have God permitting Satan to persecute Job and that Job is actually coming through those trials in faith and obedience and love to God in spite of the things that are happening to him. And then you end up having most of the book a conversation between Job and his friends in a poetic form. It's kind of like a song or a um, maybe a musical theater that was done where you had different people res uh, representing different viewpoints and talking for one or two chapters and then somebody else uh, will chime in and speak as well. So it's almost like a play in a lot of ways. Okay, good. What other styles can you think of? Historical. Good. Historical. And here we might just call it narrative. So it's like a narrator is telling the story, okay? So historical narrative, what would be an example of a book in the Bible that's more of a, a narrative, it's a story that's being told? Genesis. Good, Genesis is certainly that, especially uh, when you get to like the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, um, even Adam and Eve in the early chapters, you have narrative that's going on. Interestingly, Genesis is part of a larger body of five books and we'll get to that in just a minute. So it's kind of a subset of something else that's going on in those early books of the Bible. Dylan? Luke. Good, Luke. So anytime we have a gospel, one of the main things that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is a narrative. There's a story about who? Jesus, of course. 
and about what he said and what he did and other people that he healed or people that he taught and how they related to him. Good. Heidi? Ruth. Ruth is another great story, a little four-chapter book that tells it's a love story and it's also a story about how God was getting ready to send his son and that he was he we're learning something about the family of David eventually that Jesus will come from that bloodline. So Ruth is a great example. And um, you know, Esther is another historical narrative. Stories like Ezra and Nehemiah and David, and uh, there's many, many characters in the Bible that we have stories, and we'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. Can you think of any other styles in the Bible, literary styles? Those are two big ones. This is kind of like poetry and prose here, but what else do we have? Law, good, okay. So we have a lot of laws, don't we? The chief laws that we think of would be the Ten Commandments, and those are recorded for us in Exodus chapter 20, and they're repeated one generation later in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any graven images. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. holy. Do not take my name in vain, God says. So we have these different laws and commands, and those are expanded to where they're applied to different situations. What does it mean? Like, how do you respond if somebody does something to you? What is the appropriate judicial action that you take? And so there's a lot of case law uh, of God saying, if this happens, this is what you do. If this happens, this is what you do. And so primarily you think of like Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. There's a lot of law in those. And the first five books of the Old Testament are actually called the Torah which is the Hebrew word for law. Okay? There are other places that we have law as well, uh, but the Old Testament was the Old Covenant, and it all builds on those first five books of the Old Testament. When we get to the New Testament, actually this morning when we studied the Sermon on the Mount, this is Jesus saying, these are the laws of my kingdom. So he's building a lot on what's already been said in the past. And remember, he says that it's not just a matter of whether you actually kill somebody, but he says, in my kingdom, what else constitutes murder? To think about it. To think about somebody's murder. Or to be what? Angry. If you're angry and hateful at someone, Jesus says, in my kingdom, that is equal to death. Because to think in your heart and have hatred and to call someone a fool and to, to plot their death or their down. Play. Like you're, you're thinking hurtful thoughts and Jesus says my kingdom is not just about you know jumping through the hoops and doing what you're supposed to do when but it's not just about the externals but it's also about the heart and he says it's not just adultery but actually if you think a lustful thought in your heart then that is considered adultery so he's building upon the law of the Ten Commandments and saying that the standard is higher because God cares about your heart. And you need the Lord in order to change your heart so that you will desire to do what is right rather than wrong. Good. Go ahead. Well, there's songs in the Bible. It's not, well, I guess, I guess that's my question. Would you consider them poetry or, or like songs, like Song Deborah? Or the one that's really come to my mind is the one here in Timothy. Are those songs? Great question. So there's a lot of songs in the Bible. We have... Uh, we're going to look in just a moment at the Song of Moses. There's the Song of Deborah, Miriam. Um, we obviously have the entire book of Psalms. And there's other songs that pop up. There's a few like in Samuel as well. Uh, we get to the New Testament. We have like Zechariah. We have Elizabeth, Mary. And you mentioned one in, in uh, Timothy, like kind of a hymn, like an early hymn that he wrote. It's a hymn. Yeah. A lot of times those would be considered poetic. So they're not necessarily um, like a story. They're not necessarily a historical narrative in the traditional sense. They're more of a poetic, kind of a flourished, kind of, you know, when you think about poetry, it's like beauty in words. And that's what a lot of songs are, is it's not just finding the shortest way from point A to point B to say what needs to be said, but it's like taking kind of the scenic route and you're like, you're thinking about it and you're stirring up the emotions and you're, you're appealing to the senses, and so there's beauty involved in poetry that captures certain emotions that, like narrative, doesn't. Yeah. So I would say most songs are going to be poetry. Because he writes it in a letter, poem, mm -hmm. so he embellishes the words of this hymn. So it's, I don't know if you call it poetry or if you call it 
<laughs> well, and actually, you bring up, since you mentioned Titus and like the letters of Paul, there's another form of literature. And uh, let me see if I can find the term that he uses here in the notes. It was right toward the end. Um, he calls it on page 134, logical discourse. So logical discourse would be basically the epistles. The epistles were letters and they were teachings and they were logical teachings. There was a certain point he was trying to make. There was a certain sin that he was trying to address or encouragement he was trying to give. And so it's very logical, very systematic. And he's going through to make a case. Like you think about Romans. I mean, that is logic par excellence. It's the logic of the gospel. And he's working all the way through systematically what he wants to say about how salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ. And that that's the power of God that leads to salvation. And then it leads to a changed life and how we live today. So you want to add anything else to that? No, I just, you know, in three, I don't know what it is, 316 says, great indeed, we confess is the mystery of godliness. Mm -hmm. And then he goes in, he says, he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in the world, so he's embellishing what God said. So would that be, that, that would probably be poetry, right? I think it would be. Yeah. Yeah. I think Paul's being poetic there, and either he composed that hymn, or maybe that hymn was already being used, and he wrote it down, because it's a trustworthy saying, so it's something that was being repeated in the early churches. Maybe it was like a, a creed that they recited, or maybe it was a song that they sung. But those trustworthy statements sometimes were things that, you know, you go into different churches and you'd hear the churches repeating that or singing that, and then they were writing it down to be re remembered. But that would be like a poem, yeah. yeah he's trying to encourage Timothy. So we could add down here uh, logical discourse, or we could say especially like the epistles, the letters. Now, there's a common pattern in a lot of the epistles. Most epistles or letters can be broken down into two parts. Do you know what they are? There's usually a first half that's doing one thing, and then the second half is doing something else. This is true of like Romans, Ephesians, Colossians. Is one of them doctrine? Good. So a lot of times the first half of a letter is focusing on doctrine, and it's, it's laying out the doctrine of the gospel or some particular... Uh, some of them focus more on the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of, like Colossians is dealing a lot with the doctrine of Christ because there was heresy going on in that church and they had brought in some of the pagan ideas and superstition. So um, you have doctrine in that first, usually about the half to two thirds of a letter. And then what would be the second half of a letter? Implication. Perfect. Application. Implication. So you have doctrine and then you have application. And application is very important, but application flows out of our theology. So first we need to know what God has said, and then we know how we should live in light of that, or what God has done, and now who we are to be, and what we are to do. So in Romans, for example, those early chapters talk about how God saved us from our sins through Christ, and then he says that we're to put on the Holy Spirit, and we're to live sanctified lives, and we're to treat our brothers and sisters with love, and he talks about how we're to exercise our spiritual gifts, and we're to show Christian liberty and respect others and their convictions. And you have all these different applications, but those come after the theology of the cross. Good. So doctrine and then application. Uh, if, you know, if you want kind of a alliterative way of saying that, you have the imperatives. Those are the commands. And then before that, I should have written this first, is the indicatives. So the indicatives are the statements. The indicatives are the statements of what is truth. That's the doctrine. The imperatives are the commands of, so what? What does this mean for how we should live? And that's a very common pattern that you'll see within this style of literature of the epistles. Deuteronomy is a good example of that. Yeah, Deuteronomy, in many ways, even though that would be law, but there really is both, isn't there? There's the commands, but there's also the doctrine of like, this is who I am, God says, and this is what I've done for you, and now this is how you're to live in light of who I am. So, the curses, the curses and the blessings, for sure. Good. Anything else on that? How about uh, prophetic? Good, good. Prophetic. Prophecy. That's a big one. Prophecy. 
So we have in the Old Testament, Moses himself was a prophet. And then later on, we see um, there's a whole grouping called the major prophets of Isaiah and Jeremiah. Jeremiah writes Lamentations, Ezekiel and Daniel. Those are all prophets. And then you get to the minor prophets. So, you know, that second half of the Old Testament is all prophetic literature. It's pointing back to the law. Some people have described the prophets as basically being like um, God's police officers. Like they don't write the law, but they enforce the law. So the prophets are coming behind the lawgiver and saying, this is what's going to happen if you disobey the law. This is what's going to happen if you keep the law. So they're there to enforce the law that has already begun. They're not necessarily changing the laws as prophets, especially in the Old Testament. When you get to Jesus, he fulfills the law. He's the great and ultimate prophet, and he fulfills the law, and he explains what things he has completed and what things will continue on. But the prophets typically are not law givers, they're law enforcers, okay? And a lot of the Bible is prophetic in nature. So would uh, Revelation fall under its own, or would it be under prophecy? Good question. Would Revelation fall under prophecy? I was thinking that same thing right before you said that. <laughs> Where does Revelation fit into all of this? Now, Revelation is interesting because, like a lot of other books, it actually has several different styles. The first chapter of Revelation, do you remember what it's about? Okay, right before that, even before we get to the letters to the churches. Yes, who God is. So we have this vision of Jesus Christ the resurrected Christ in all of his glory found in, in uh, Revelation chapter 1. So that would, I mean, I, I got to be careful here uh, off the top of my head. I would say that's maybe almost more of a narrative along with there's a discourse because Jesus is conversing and he's talking. He's giving a revelation to John. Then we move into two chapters which are like letters to the churches. We have these epistles. There's seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor, and those churches in a lot of ways represent the different kinds of churches that continue to be in the present age. And then you get to chapters four and five, and you kind of shift gears away from what's currently going on to what's going to happen in the future. And that would be, you could say it's prophecy in many ways because it's prophetic and it's talking about the future, but there's actually a specialized form of prophecy, and it's called Apocalypse or apocalyptic prophecy. So it deals with a lot of visions. There's um, a lot of times it's it's almost like fantasy literature, like you know dragons and stars and all these kinds of things. That it's almost like sci-fi or fantasy. Um, a lot of figurative language. A lot of times, as you read through, it will give you kind of the legend and the key of what things mean. So it will tell you a lot of times, but it's not always saying it. It all like a narrative style. It's very, very vivid, uh, full of imagery, full of symbolism, and so it takes a little bit of a different approach to apocalypse to get what the message is it's trying to be said. It's also dealing a lot with judgments, but then also with blessings. Good. Anybody else want to add to that? Let's look at an example then. Go ahead and take your Bible and turn over to Exodus chapter 14, and I think this is kind of cool because within very close proximity to each other, you get to see how genres work together and how they do different things. So Exodus chapter 14. By this point, God has already appeared to Moses in the wilderness through the burning bush. God sent Moses back to Egypt. Moses went before Pharaoh and gave the message that God commanded, let my people go. Pharaoh refused. God sent how many different plagues? Ten different plagues, yeah. And of course, the final plague, which was the worst of all, that was the what? Well, actually, you go beyond that even. The death of the firstborn, which led to the Passover. Yes, so all those other ones, the death of, of livestock and boils and locusts and hailstones and Nile in the blood and all these different things were horrific. And then you get to the very, very last where... A vast amount of the Egyptian population was destroyed in the death of the firstborn for anyone that didn't have the sacrificial lamb and the blood that was spread on the lintel and the doorposts of their home and that was eating the Passover meal. Okay, so all of that has happened. Then the people of Israel are finally permitted to leave Egypt. 
and to go out into the wilderness where God had commanded them to go to worship him. Now, watch this. You know this story, but uh, it's, it's good to be reminded of it again. In chapter 14, verse 15, the Lord says to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in and after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his, ho his host, his chariots and his horsemen. Um, side note right there. Do you see where it says glory over Pharaoh and all of his host? What do you think that the host is referring to? His gods. I don't think so. No? No. This was often a reference to a king's armies. And so, have you ever heard the expression, the Lord of hosts? In Hebrew, it was Yahweh Sabaoth. Uh, Yahweh or Jehovah Sabaoth. And that's the Hebrew for host. Sabaoth is host. So, um, there's an old hymn um, which Martin Luther wrote. Um, a mighty fortress is our God. And there's a line in there, Lord Sabaoth is he, something along those lines. And we're actually calling God the Lord of hosts. We're not saying that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus says that in another place, but that's a completely different word and a, a different language. When God is called the Lord of hosts, he is calling himself the God of all armies and the God of the angelic army above. So he's, he's talking about how he's a warrior God and he can defeat any other army that exists, including the army of Satan himself. So here, I just wanted to point out, this is a passage where we see the word host using in a way that sometimes it's referred to God as the Lord of hosts. Here it's saying Pharaoh and all of his hosts are going to be destroyed and give God glory. Uh, and then it refers to Pharaoh's chariots and his horsemen. So God is going for the jugular. He's going for that point of greatest strength in Egypt. And when he defeats them, God will get the glory with his victory. Look at verse 18. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God who is going before the host of Israel. Remember, this is the same angel of God that already has destroyed many of the firstborn. So now the angel of God was going before Israel and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved before them and stood behind them. So it almost seems to be kind of encompassing them and protecting them from all sides, like a, a force field almost. Coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. Okay? So in the daytime, God's presence would be represented by what? In the daytime, by a cloud, and then at nighttime, what? Fire, like this pillar or, or this wall of fire that would be between the two armies. Can you imagine what that must have looked like, both from Israel's side and also from Egypt's side? Moses stretches out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, and in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back over the Egyptians upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned. I mean, this must have been millions and millions of gallons that were stored up on each side that all of a sudden they're in the middle, they've been clogged by the mud, all the Israelites have gotten safely to the other side, and now the Egyptians are chasing after them and they're in some kind of confusion and frenzy, and all of a sudden those giant walls of water come over the top of them. What? The sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared, the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw them into the midst of the sea, the waters returned and covered the chariots 
and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. So two miracles happen here. One was God turning the sea into the dry land, and the other was actually returning the sea to the land to destroy the Egyptians that were pursuing the army. And at that point, Israel was now safely on the other side of the Red Sea and was able to go to meet God at Sinai. Go ahead. I always thought that that was done instantly. The destruction of the Egyptians? Yeah, when he brought the sea back over the Egyptians. But I've never noticed this until you read it just now. It says here, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. So he waited till morning to do it? Well, he had possibly up to two million Jews that had to cross the sea. So that's like, half of Los Angeles having to walk through a passage to get through a body of water to the other side. So it may have been a very wide passageway and there may have been hundreds of people filing one, you know, a side of another, but it would have taken probably several hours for all of them to get through the Red Sea to the other side. And then sometime by, you know, late night, early morning, uh, God's holding back Pharaoh and his army until Israel can get through. And then it's like that curtain of fire is removed, and they pursue, and then they get confused. And at some point, like it says, there in the morning is when they're destroyed. They'd have to be almost empty. They'd be able to get out. And they may have been, again, like several rows wide, and maybe kind of the whole length of the passageway where the dry land was. So there must have been thousands and thousands of soldiers and chariots and horses and everything that, that were all in the sea. Some of them that were almost on the other side. And then others that had just started to go into the sea as well. And the ones I feel sorry for were the horses because they were only doing what their masters made them do. <laughs> they didn't do anything wrong, did they? Okay, so what kind of literature did we just read that's on this list here? What kind of style was that? The narrative. Yes, that was a story, right? That was a narrative. It was a story. There was like a narrator that was telling us what happened. Usually narrative, unless there's some conversation going on, but most of it is what we call the third person. It's describing, he did this, she did this, this happened, then this happened, and it came to pass this. So usually there's a telling by kind of an outside source. Moses, of course, is the one that wrote this down, and he's describing an event that took place. He's actually describing himself in the third person. <laughs> he's the one that's writing this about what happened to him. So he's narrating it for us, okay? He had the conversation. Yes, he had the conversation. He was there. Now, this is fascinating. Look at this with me. Chapter 15. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. What kind of literature do you think we're going into now? Poetry. Okay, we're about to move from narrative in chapter 14 over to poetry in chapter 15. Notice how the same event is described not as narrative, but in poetry. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. That's poetry. Do you, do you see how both are equally true and inspired by God, but the style is so different. What do you notice about the difference in those styles? Anything that sticks out to you? One of the stories telling us like it is, like it factually is. Mm -hmm. The other one is trying to reach your heart, mm -hmm. your mind. That's a great way to put it. So one is kind of the factual events that took place, and then the other really does like reach to the heart and the mind. Into the way the it flows and everything. It has a flow to it and a beauty to it. Good. Very descriptive, isn't it? So we have, you know, I love like that one. Uh, verse that I read there where it talked about the floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. I mean, it's like 
you just see this rock sinking further and further and further into the deep. And all of a sudden you have imagery that's available there that wasn't described. And kind of thankfully so, like this is a terrifying scene and we don't see like the screaming and the bodies and the faces as they're sinking down, but now it's using poetic language to talk about how a stone would sink to the bottom, uh, to the bottom floor of the sea. And so there's a lot of imagery and a lot of emotion. Were you gonna say something else, Connie? Praising. And praising, yes, a lot of praise. So not just what happened, but God's getting the glory for this. And so we see how the, the, the attention is being directed to God who orchestrated these events and that he's being praised. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. I will praise him. Good. One of the most common features of poetry is found right here in Exodus chapter 15, and that is what we call parallelism. Parallelism, parallelism is where you have one line, and then the next line will often sort of repeat and retell and maybe say it in a slightly different way. So, uh, for example, verse 4, Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea. That's like line one of Hebrew poetry. And then notice in the second statement, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. So we're not talking about something entirely different. It's kind of a retelling of what was just said in the first half. And maybe also adding something new that not only are we thinking about Pharaoh and his chariots and horsemen and his army, but now we're thinking about all the chosen officers all of his military trained experts were also lost in the battle and not just called the sea in general terms, but the Red Sea in very specific terms. So in English poetry, a lot of times we think about it having rhyme to it and there's rhythm and there's meter. Well, in Hebrew poetry, it didn't necessarily rhyme a lot of times, but what it did do is it used a lot of parallelism to put two things close to each other and they would kind of compare and contrast them. You notice it in verse 6, your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. And then in the second half of the verse, your right hand, O Lord. So again, he's being addressed as Lord, all capitals. This is Yahweh. Your right hand, which is this one, right? Looks like it's the left from your position, but this is my right hand, and the right hand represented what? This is a manners and customs issue as we think about the right hand of someone in the ancient Near East would represent power and strength. So God's strength, and then what does it say in the second half? It is glorious. Your right hand, glorious in power. Your right hand shatters the enemy. So God concentrates all of his strength and power to shatter and destroy those that had blasphemed his name. And God gets glory for that. Okay, so there's a lot of parallelism when we look at poetry. I want to show you one other place where this same incident is described in poetic form, and that's in Psalm 106. Flip over to Psalm 106. Same event, also poetic. You could tell that this event of coming out of Egypt, going across the Red Sea, it became part of um, the, the Hebrew storytelling, and it, it was... It was certainly an event that uh, stuck with them and that they repeated time and time again in stories around the campfire and as they were raising their kids and as they sang songs of worship to God. And here it appears once again because it was one of the great demonstrations of God's glory. Psalm 106, beginning in verse 7. It says, Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love. But they rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry. And he led them through the deep as through a desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foe and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. And the waters covered their adversaries. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words they sang his praise, but they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel. Here we have the same story being told, but we really see a spiritual emphasis here, don't we? About former unbelief, about uh, sinning and committing iniquity and doing wickedness, and then seeing God's great power, giving him glory, and then forgetting the very things that he had done and slipping back into that idolatry and disbelief once again. But it's poetic in nature, and it's describing that same event. 
Any comments on any of that? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Good question. Lamentations would be, yes, definitely poetry. Yep, it was a song, and that actually brings up a really good point. A lot of times, songs in the Bible were praise, but the other most common kind of song was lament. What is a lament? It's a sad song. It's singing the blues. So um, it could be sadness over death. It could be sadness over sin. A lot of times it was sadness either over someone's sin or over some kind of suffering that the writer was going through. So Lamentations is the lament of, of uh, Jeremiah when he was watching his beloved nation of um, Israel and the people of Jerusalem being destroyed by God's judgment through Babylon. Let's just try a little exercise here real quick. Turn to, I'm going to start in Psalm 28. And let's see if we can identify a couple psalms here, if they are more like a praise song or more like a bluesy lament kind of a song, okay? So is it praise or lament? Praise or lament, that's the game we're going to play here. Psalm 28 of David. To you, O Lord, I call, my rock, be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Okay, we've only seen or read one verse. Do you think that's probably praise or lament? That's lament. It's lament. You can tell it's crying out for help. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help. Good. Chapter 29, a psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Praise, praise or lament? Praise. That's a praise. Very different tone. Chapter 30. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have drawn me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cry to you for help, and you have healed me. O Lord, you've brought up my soul from Sheol. You restored me to life from among those who go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, O you his saints, and give thanks to his holy name. Down in verse 8, to you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. And I read a little bit further in that one because the first few verses made me think it was one kind. But as I go down a little bit further, I changed my mind on that. Do you think that's praise or lament? It's both. Oh. it's both. Maybe if we have to pick one or the other, I would say it's more lament than praise. It was praise because he was already seeing God answer his prayers and he was trusting that God was going to take care of him. But then he kind of, and you felt this, like you know God's in control, but then you slide back into kind of that despair and that despondency again. You're still struggling as you're going through that trial. So here is David who's thankful to God and praising him for his faithfulness, but still in the middle of some pretty serious affliction, and he's still crying to God. You know, and I don't know how often we do that. We probably don't do it often enough as a church or as people to just cry out to God and ask for help. And even to ask him, Lord, listen to me. Because we're thinking, of course he listens to us. But the psalmist a lot of times would say, Lord, give me your ear. Listen to me. Please hear my cry. Because God cares for us. And he invites us to talk to him. But it's okay to say, Lord, hear me. Please hear my prayer. Listen to me. I know I've said this again and again and again. And I come to you once again, Lord. Please hear my prayers. Jesus even talks about how when we pray, we need to be persistent in our prayers, and that's what the psalmist is doing. So that would be both a lament and a praise, and a lot of times, um, laments will kind of morph into a praise by the end of the psalm. So maybe it was sort of uh, a minor key for a lot of it, and it was kind of a sour uh, sort of a story, or some sadness, or some suffering that's going on, and then you get to the end, and you see how now it's sort of unfolded. It's kind of like the, the sunrise that appears after a dark night and all of a sudden it turns to something beauty and it, it all resolves by the end. So look in verse 11 of that same chapter. Right after he said, Hear, O Lord, be merciful, O Lord, be my helper. Then in verse 11, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Emotions are complicated. 
life is complicated. It's messy. And the Psalms really, really represent the low lows and the high highs and how we go through different times. Even in a single day, we can have some really rough moments and then we have some really glorious moments. And Psalms are great when it comes to counseling and comfort to see how complicated life is, but what a life of faith looks like to God. Go ahead. I had a discussion about God and his emotions. If you know. Mm -hmm. okay. But in the Old Testament, you read, Oh Israel, if you just listen to me. You know, it's like he's lamenting for Israel, God himself. So God had those kind of emotions. I agree. God definitely does have emotions. And, you know, we, we've talked about this a little bit because there was a view that developed over the centuries that we know God doesn't change. Like there is no shifting of shadow. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And took, some people took that to such an extreme that if God can't change, then it would be impossible for him to have emotions because emotions is a change in being. Well, that's going beyond what the scripture teaches because the Bible says that his character doesn't change. His personhood and his attributes don't change, but he is involved with his creation and he does experience emotion. And that's part of being made in the image of God is we are emotional creatures because God is an emotional God. Everything he just read, everything we just read. Yeah, I don't know what it was, people living by. This was mm -hmm. breathed out by God himself. Mm -hmm. Love with an emotion. How could he not be an emotional God when he's inspiring these very words. Good point. Love is an emotion. Anger is an emotion. Mm -hmm. um, jealousy. Yeah, jealousy. And he, he, he states himself, I am a jealous God. Mm -hmm. That's why he doesn't want us worshiping anybody that's or right. anything else because he is jealous and that's an emotion. Good point. A lot of his attributes tie right in with emotions and they're perfectly expressed in a way that we've never seen except in God himself. I mean, We've all felt anger, we've all felt a sense of jealousy, uh, or joy, or love, mm -hmm. but God always expresses those things perfectly, and uh, without any kind of sin or, or tainting at all. So, yeah, we, we're definitely seeing God's emotion even in these passages here. A couple others, chapter 31, uh, it begins, To the choir master, a psalm of David. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. So, praise or lament? That's a lament. He's That's a lament. He's crying for help. Very good. A lot of times a lament is kind of spilling out your guts and your, your sorrows, but it's also crying to the Lord for help. And there is that instinct. Think about a baby and how they cry out to mom and dad for help. You know, we, we were created to be needy beings. And a lot of our lament kinds of prayers are just crying to God because we know we need help and we know we can't fix it in our own strength. And so, especially as believers who know the Lord, it's going to become our reaction that we want to talk to God and ask him for help when hard things happen. And he is quick to be there, as it says here, to rescue us speedily from what we go through. Chapter 32, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. It's praise or lament? Praise. That's praise. Okay, so blessed, happy is the one who's been forgiven. Now this praise came after a very dark time in David's life, after he had sinned with Bathsheba. We know Psalm 51, right? Unto you and you alone have I sinned. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. And in Psalm 51, David is confessing that would be a lament of his sin. Well, now the broken wounds have been healed. And this now turns to praise in Psalm 32. So even though they're in different sections of the Psalm book, think in your mind about how Psalm 51 and Psalm 32 go together. Because 51 is after Nathan, in narrative of the scripture in 2 Samuel, points his finger and, at David and says, you are the man. You are that king that robbed the single sheep of the poor man. You were the one that took away that beautiful bride that didn't belong to you and committed, you know, that act of adultery and then murder. And so Nathan confronts David. David, after a year of hiding his sin and being in a form of misery, then he confesses his sin in Psalm 51, and then he finds healing from his brokenness in, in uh, Psalm 32. And that lament turns into 
praise. Um, in verse 5, it says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. That right there is the sign of true repentance. Because a lot of times people will feel sorry for what they did, but mostly because they're sorry they got caught. Or they're sorry for the consequences they have to pay. But here he says, I didn't hide it up. I didn't hide it or cover it anymore. I know you can see it, God, and now I'm openly admitting what I did wrong. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And that has got to be one of the most beautiful statements in all the Bible. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. David knew how seriously he had broken God's law, and yet he said, you forgave me. I didn't deserve that, but you forgave me. And the amazing thing is, he's looking forward to to what his great, great, great grandson Jesus is going to do on the cross. Jesus hasn't lived and died and imputed his righteousness to David yet, but David knows somehow God is going to forgive him of his sin. And of course, we know that forgiveness is only possible by the shedding of Christ's blood. So this is pointing us forward to what Jesus is going to do on our behalf. Go ahead. This little word, Selah, that comes uh -huh. after a lot of... Selah. Yeah, anybody know what Selah means? Yeah. It might mean that. It very well might mean that. We actually, we actually don't know for sure what Selah means. I mean, I, I've heard some of the best Bible scholars in the present day who have said there's four or five very quite possible, plausible meanings, but we don't have a definitive answer. It could be um, to, to sit and ponder and meditate on what's just been said. Mm -hmm. It could actually be a musical instruction, like a reprise or a pause, or it could be something that was an instruction for whoever the musician was. It's part of the inspired scripture, so I encourage you to read it. But this is a rare word in the Bible. We don't know 100% for sure what it means. Kind of a sigh or a relief, maybe. Yeah, it, it pops up a lot, and it is a mystery word. That could be a, a pretty neat discovery. If somebody finally figured out once and for all what Selah means, that would be a neat <laughs> biblical... Um, Jerry knows what it means. You're going to tell us right now. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know either, but what it, the way I... What I think it is, is to stop, is to pause, to meditate on what you yeah. just read right. before you go to the next... Kind of along the yeah. same lines. Yeah. So you can understand what you're going to read. It would certainly make good sense. That, that's a very good possibility. Um, and there's nothing wrong with taking that advice and stopping and pondering what's just been read before moving on. Send my best guy an email and ask him. <laughs> he should. Yeah. See, see if he'll answer you. Well, I thought you were going to say Jeff. Jeff Orge. Jeff Orge. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, check with him and see if he'll answer you. Good. I want to talk about one other thing tonight, just a little bit more in depth, and that is narrative. Uh, this is found on pages 128 and 129 of the book. And there's a chart that appears in um, those pages that is really giving you the, the age old, since the beginning of time, the age old formula for a good story, okay? There's a little chart there and it looks like this. It starts flat, it climbs up, and then it dips down, and then it sort of flat lines again like that. This right here is how to write a story or how to tell a story. And the Bible is filled with incredible stories. So this is the basic mapping of any story, any book, any movie. Uh, it follows a typical formula of what you have at the beginning is, we could just call it the introduction or the background. And then you have what he calls the uh, problem or complication. When you get to the tip here, this is where the problem gets worse and worse and worse until finally it reaches that point of greatest tension. It's like the spring has been wound as tightly as it can and it's got to let all that energy out. This is what we call the climax. And then you have at the very end the conclusion. We live happily ever after, right? <laughs> so, this is the common formula for just about any story. Now, a lot of times, a more in-depth story is gonna look like this, because it's gonna have small problems that are resolved, but then it's growing toward a greater problem, and typically, in the last 
chapter or two of a book or in the last 15 to 20 minutes of a movie, you're going to get to that climax. It's always that really great epic battle that takes place at the end. And then all of a sudden, the last few minutes are the result where all the pieces are put in place and you get to have that satisfactory feeling of, ah, there's a side for us, right? You finally get to the end and it's been tense and tense and tense for about the last third of the story. And then finally, it's like everything is the way it's supposed to be. Now that's in a typical formula. Sometimes it doesn't have that. And maybe it's because there's gonna be a part two later, or maybe it's because it was written to be a tragedy where it really didn't have the ending. I mean, Romeo and Juliet, and all of a sudden all the key characters are killed and you're left with kind of this sense of like, well, now what happens? And so it doesn't always lead to a happy ending, but typically, especially in uh, the Bible and in a lot of stories that we're familiar with, it will lead to a conclusion, okay? So three little pigs, and you know, they're all just minding their own business, building their homes, and all of a sudden, the wolf brings this problem where he wants, he's hungry, he wants a meal. And so he's going after each of them. Each house is like a small problem with a climax building is something bigger where they evade him and then they go to the next house and then they evade him again and they go to the next house so there's safety for a moment Whew, okay they got away from him and then finally they show in the brick house and what's going to happen now and he's blown down the other houses and then of course he falls into the chimney and he ends up being boiled by a pot of stew or whatever so there's this conclusion of okay yay the pigs win the wolf loses they live to see another day so and since pigs eat anything by why he gets done being boiled in a pot of stew, they got their own meal. They got their own meal. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes there's like that great irony or a twist in the end, right? The one who was chasing now all of a sudden gets eaten. So <laughs> those are always great stories. So let's just look at an example real quick. Luke chapter 15. Abby, this is, this is your verse. This is the one you want to look up if you're not. Are you already there? Luke chapter 15. You were there earlier. Okay. <laughs> you only had to wait an hour for us to get to the verse you wanted to read. <laughs> Luke chapter 15, verse 3. Are you there, Abby? Luke chapter what? 15. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Dylan can help you if you still need help finding it. So he told them this. You got it? Okay. You want to read it? Read three and four. Okay, very good. That right there is a story. It has all of the elements, all of the building blocks of a story, even though it's just one verse, verse four. Let's see if we can identify the different parts of it. So first of all, there's some background information that's being given. What do we know as it sets the stage and you always have character development at the beginning of a story and there's a scene that's introduced. So don't give me any of the plot line yet. I just want the, the scene painted for us. What do we know? A shepherd has a hundred sheep. Okay, so we have, I'm going to break it down. I mean, you're right on. I'm just going to break it down into several parts. We know that there's a man involved. We know that this man is a shepherd. We know that he doesn't just own one or two or a dozen sheep, but he owns a hundred sheep, right? There's a hundred of them that he is caring for. What man of you having a hundred sheep? Okay. Stop there for a second. Yes. Well, wouldn't you, the intro is, so he told them this parable. So he, you, the, the intro is, I have, you know he's going to be a parable. Yeah, where's that eraser? What? That's, that's good here because what's happening is Jesus is telling us, um, he's about to tell us a story or a parable. So this whole thing, from here to here, you and I, as the reader, understand this is a parable story. That is a special kind of literature or genre. So 
This isn't part of the story itself, but it tells us this is not a real story. I mean, it could be, but this is, this is a special kind of story or illustration that Jesus is giving. So you and I, in the back of our mind, as he tells this story, we're thinking the whole time, this is a parable, this is a parable, which means there's a main point that we need to glean from the story that he's about to give. And actually, it's the first of three parables that all go together and have the same message. Good. So that's, that's not part of the story itself. That's like you and I, as the observers, are watching the story, and we know, oh, this is a parable that Jesus is telling right now. Good. So we know that he was a man, he's a shepherd, he has a hundred sheep. Uh-oh, problem. What's the problem? One's missing. One is lost. Yeah, but there's 99 that are still okay. But that's not the point of the story, right? The tension comes, and all of a sudden, he has 100 sheep. He's counting them, you know, 78, 79, 97, 98, 99. Where's that 100th sheep? Oh, no. I've got to find it. Where did I last see that sheep? And so there's tension here that a sheep has been lost. What does that mean for that sheep? <laughs> Might have been in the stew pot. The wolf caught this one. Could very well be. <laughs> I mean, think about it. as a story, what tension does this create? When you start thinking about, you've got 100 sheep. In our household, we have a, a love-hate relationship with our dogs. We, we mostly try and love them, but there are times that we hate them. <laughs> but... As, as much as they frustrate us at times, overall we love our animals and are thankful for them. And imagine if one of them got lost. And you start, start thinking about what's going through your mind when a pet has been lost. Is it dead? Is it alive? In the present day, did it get hit by a car? Did it get caught by a coyote? I've got to find it. We've got to make posters and post them. We've got to put this online for friends to see. Let's go get in our van and start driving around. Does it have its collar? Did it have a label? Yes. Has anybody called? Let's check the phone. So all of a sudden there's tension there. Where's our animal? Is it okay? It might be scared. It might be hurt. So that tension is being created. Even though it's a very, very short little statement here. What man of you having 100 sheep if he had lost one of them? But the tension has now come into the story, and there's a problem that needs to be fixed. Yeah? We did almost lose one of our dogs. She's, she's our escape artist, and so she figured out how to climb up our wood pile and over the fence and get outside, and she oh, all of a of sudden scratches on our front door where she's not supposed to be. <laughs> And then we like grabbed the flashlights and ran outside and we're looking around. Where is she? Where is she? She came home. I had to take a <laughs> apricot tree out of my yard when I was living in Norwalk because my uh, littlest dog would climb the apricot tree to get on top of the fence to get to the front of the fence where it wasn't, and we're talking about a six foot block wall, to get to the front That's of the fence where it's not dog. quite so high and get down and take off. So we had to get somebody out there to take away my oh, apricot oh, 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 It's too bad you lost your fruit. <laughs> 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 yeah, they're pretty sharp. They figured out a way. So the problem is one out of the hundred has been lost. And what you have is not a lot of detail is given. This is a very, very short, compacted story, but it simply says one is lost. And so what is the shepherd going to do? What does he do? He looks for it. He looks for it, right? He leaves them, finds them a safe place, because he doesn't want to come back and have lost another 67 sheep while he went after the one. So we assume they're in a safe place, and the focus shifts to the shepherd as he's looking for the sheep. And very quickly it says, having 100 sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost. <laughs> You know, probably calling the name of that sheep. 
Fluffy, Fluffy, where are you? And hunting around, looking around, trying to use every bit of daylight that's left. Yeah, calling out, bad, bad. <laughs> um, you know, probably has his staff with him in case he has to beat a predator away or pull him out from a cliff somewhere. So you're picturing the shepherd on this quest to try and find the lost sheep, wondering if he will ever see it again. And then the, the problem, the tension is building, it's building, it's building, it's lost. The shepherd has gone to find it. And then we have this great conclusion where it says that until he finds it. So he finds the sheep. Hooray! The sheep, the lost sheep has been found. And not only are we told that the sheep is found, and that gives us a sense of, of, of resolve. Woo! Okay, good. The sheep was found. The sheep is okay. But on top of that, there's something else that happens. And Abby didn't read this verse, but we have a very satisfying conclusion to this story because it says, when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders. You see, the tension is gone. The, the resolve has already taken place. So we're not dealing with problem. We're actually having comfort given now that that lost sheep is now wrapped around the shoulders of the shepherd, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. So the, there's finding, there's comfort, there's closeness, and there's, key word here, joy. joy. There's joy. That's all part of the conclusion to this story. Very short story. More emphasis is given on the rejoicing than on the lostness. Now, there's two more stories. One is of a lost coin, and the other is of what? Prodigal son. The prodigal son, a lost son that rejects his father, eventually wanders off, and then remembers the goodness of his father and says, I need to go home. I remember the goodness and the love of my dad. Maybe he'll at least let me be a slave. He was a good man. And so the son comes home, and there's what? Joy, rejoicing. There's a feast, and there's a second half to that story where we have the older brother who is self-righteous, and he represents the Pharisees. So we actually have a tease. We think the story's over with a climax and conclusion, but then all of a sudden there's an additional problem and tension that the older son doesn't rejoice with the father. And we're seeing um, how God is loving and kind and forgiving toward those who humble themselves and come to him. We are the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. That's you and me. That's describing us. God is the father. He is the shepherd. And then we see that the Jews who were upset that God would show forgiveness and mercy, they are the older self-righteous brother that resented God for his goodness. Okay? So that's how a basic story works. It's a common map, and it's something you want to be aware of as you're reading stories in the Bible. Sometimes the stories are short. Sometimes they're long. In fact, this entire book is basically a story, Genesis 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Day 1, he makes light. Day 2, he separates the waters. Day 6, he makes man and woman and all the rest of the land animals. Day 7, God's, God rests. All of that is intro. No tension yet, just beauty and goodness and love. And then you hit Genesis chapter 3, and all of a sudden... The serpent was the craftiest of all animals and came and spoke with Eve. And we spiral into this tension that builds and builds and builds. When you get to Christ, there's a wonderful resolution, but you realize he's not finished yet. There's still more tension and tension. We get through Revelation and the tension builds, doesn't it? You're reading through Revelation. You're up here at the climax of the story, the epic battle of evil and good, until finally you come to the end where Jesus returns and conquers all of the nations that have rebelled against him, and he establishes a kingdom of peace. And there's, there's resolve and there's joy, and we have this very satisfying ending of eternal life that we get to spend with God. So the entire Bible and the gospel is following the same plot line uh, and the same formula that has worked for generations. Um, it's something you want to be aware of as you're reading your Bibles. That's the Bible as literature. So tonight we talked about how the Bible is literature. It helps us to understand the different styles of genre that are used. It helps us to interpret our Bibles. And I would say it helps us to enjoy our Bibles more because we realize the Bible, not only is it true, it is, and not only is it good and righteous, it is, but it's just a pleasure to read. This book is such a joy to be able to read and study. And some people get scared off by it or intimidated. You are missing out. There are so many good stories in here. 
The greatest stories that have ever been told are found in this book right here in the Bible. I love reading other stories and listening to audiobooks and watching movies, but never miss the greatest stories of all that are found right here in this book. Okay? Any final comments? In Sunday school, we're getting ready when the new Sunday school year starts. We're getting ready to give you some of the best stories when we start learning about David and how he becomes the king and he slays the giant and he does all this other stuff. Of course, we're also going to get into his sins and, mm -hmm. and stuff. But yeah, we're looking forward to some really interesting stories in the, in the near future. Kind of nice to be done with those judges and <laughs> those scoundrels <laughs> there in the book of Judges. And yeah, but first we got to finish getting through Saul. <laughs> yep, Saul would definitely follow this. And unfortunately, his story is, is a tragedy where it ends with a climax and then a fall, a great fall. A great fall. Um, yeah. But it, it sets the tone for some kind of a greater king. So yeah. David becomes this sense of conclusion or resolve that we need yeah. a king and we need not a king like Saul, we need a, a king like David. So we have a sense of he's, Saul is building the tension in the story that prepares us for David and ultimately for David's offspring, Jesus. Very good. All right. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Turn this off here.